Hello and welcome. I am Scarperlock and this is City of Heroes on the Rebirth server. Let's rant with Scarperlock. We're with Psyop, our level 26 mutation soccer, getting close to level 27. And then we're going to have to do something with her enhancements because we got to do some crafting. She'll be able to do level 30 enhancements, but we're not quite there yet. So what we look like, I've got some blanks because, again, we're about to get to level 27. These things have all turned yellow. These are all SOs. We're going to do some IOs. We also need to put the uh, Stalker um, archetype, one of them, in here. And probably the other one will go into Greater Psyblade or possibly Telekinetic Blow. The thing with Greater Psyblade is going to take me to, like, level 37 or something to get these all slotted in. The way I do slotting because of the even slotting. I could try to beeline this. But uh, it'll still be like level 31 before it's six slotted. Whereas I could do tele telekinetic blow like at level 27, and then we'll have six slots in each, and we can put both sets of ATOs on for that level 30 breakpoint and get the buffs. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, are we on a story arc? We are on a story arc. We completed a mission for Lori, and now we're going to continue. Uh, this is World War II stuff, and we're on a story arc. Oh, this is Ubel Man. I like this story arc. It's a great story arc. So we're going to keep doing Ubel Man, and as we go... I'm going to Dark Story. I want to do a rant, and this is going to be a... sort of a follow-up to a previous episode. You can go back and look. I'm not sure which episode. It was fairly early on, where I was talking about the importance of tone, and I probably said the word tone uh, 300 times. I bet you could play a drinking game and get really drunk. I'm going to try not to use the word tone. I'll, I'll use flavor and theme and genre and other things like that to talk about it. But uh, what, what, what I want to talk about is not so much like why it matters, but tone and setting and how important it is to think about when you're, if you're as a game master, when you're trying to design a setting or use a setting that was designed by somebody else like let's say you're using I don't know the Forgotten Realms that's a bad example it's toneless um, Deadlands or you're using a Holler or something like that which are usually very strong in feel and tone and genre and theme and flavor um, it's important to understand what that flavor of the setting is and to decide as a GM what you're trying to accomplish with that what is your goal and so this comes from I was watching a a, a Savage Worlds video, there's so few of them on YouTube, this guy was talking about how he prepares to run a new setting. And he talked about getting in touch with the feel of the setting and figuring out the feeling that you want to accomplish at the beginning. And then, you know, how he goes about doing that. And I thought about this as I was watching him, and I realized that that is actually the most important thing. When you're a GM and you're preparing to run a long-term game, this isn't just for, I mean, for a single one-shot, it may not matter. But if you're, if you're planning, you and your players want to run a nice, meaty campaign. You want to go from level 1 to 20 in D&D, or you want to go all the way to Legendary in uh, Savage Worlds, or you want to start with 200-point Champions character and get to 400 points. You want to do a big, long, or maybe it's an interminable campaign, one that just we have no end date. We're just going to play forever as long as we can. Um, in that context, you have sort of two options. You can create a gonzo type of a world that has no particular set tone or feel to it if that's what you and your players want and that would be something like the Forgotten Realms where literally every possible trope in all of fiction can be found somewhere in the Forgotten Realms and any possible feel or uh, genre or theme that you might perhaps want to convey can be found somewhere in the Forgotten Realms and that's on purpose because it's a published setting in they want to make sure that every GM can do something in the Forgotten Realms so that they can sell books and make money. Um, but most Game Masters aren't planning that. And most of the time, Game Masters have a particular theme, a particular flavor, a particular feeling that they're going for. And I think to take a step back from this and ask why that is or why you might want to do that, I would urge that people should do that. Right, that if you want to have really, truly great, memorable game sessions, what you should focus on is the feeling. Now, I don't mean, like, hurt feelings, right? What I mean is the, the, the sort of intangible sense, the, um, the emotional response that players are going to have to a scene, to a session. 
So, for example, in uh, Lovecraftian cosmic horror, you might have this sort of creepy, crawly, kind of um, unsettled feeling by the end of the session. This was a very, this was very creepy, right? In a um, very violent slasher horror, it might be more of a frightening rather than creepy. In a uh, comedy game, it would be humor, and it was funny, and we laughed a lot, right? And so, one thing you want to ask is, what are we going for here? Um, always for the for the individual scenes, sure, right? But you also want to ask, what what are you going for in your campaign, right? <clears throat> and the reason I suggest that you want to focus on the feelings, the mood, I guess, is the best way to say it. The reason you want to focus on that is because when a session is over, in the future, days, weeks, months from now, what the players are going to remember and what you're going to remember after the session is not all of the details, right? Unless you take extensive notes, you're going to forget almost everything except some really surprising or amazing thing that happened. You're going to forget the details. But what you were, will remember is how that session made you feel. You will, you will remember the fear or the creepy sensation or the horror or dread. You will remember the humor and the laughter. You will remember the excitement. You will remember the boredom, right? So looking back on, for instance, um, and I, I don't want to be mean about this, but my best friend ran a almost two session long battle in the Shadowfell um, in his Candlekeep game. And, and I'm going to criticize myself for doing something similar to this too. He ran a two session battle. It, it took too long. It had two, we had a lot of players and one the uh, Finnish, the person in Finland had just returned to, from tr taking a trip there to see if they were going to move there and rejoined us. So, and she came back a session earlier than my friend expected. So this wasn't entirely his fault. We were in the Shadowfell and I think he realized with another character, I'm going to have to add villains. And he added, he had them come in ways, which is very smart because it, then it doesn't overwhelm the party, but it can keep the battle interesting. But it took a really long time. I mean, it was taking 35 to 40 minutes to get back to my round. And my character would go for a minute or two, and then I'd have to wait another half hour plus to go again. It wore on late to the evening, to the to midnight, and we were, you know, I was tired. And what I remember of that battle, other than my character falling off a roof and going splat but because she crit failed her or whatever, rolled a one on her acrobatics check, um, and I forgot to cast Featherfall, and I do remember that because I'm annoyed that I forgot to cast it. What I most remember about that battle, I don't remember any of the individual rounds, any of the blows, any of the tactics. I couldn't tell you if you showed me a bunch of different graveyard maps which one we were on. What I remember about that scene and both of those sessions is that I was bored, right? The feeling that I got from those that battle was boredom. It wasn't exciting. It didn't ever seem like we were probably going to lose. Um, it was... Sadly, you know, it was tactically interesting, and there were moments that were interesting, but the overall feeling I got from that session was boredom. And so my point is, that's what you remember. And by the way, I would say, as a criticism of my own game, same thing happened in the Shrine of the Kuatoa. It was the player's fault. They alerted the whole entire base. And then I had to, like, run an entire base of 150 you know, active counters on the map, all trying to descend on the party and fight them, and the party trying to run away, and it was a pitch battle, and it should have been super exciting. But because I had so many tokens on the board, I kept making them wait. Hang on, guys, I've got to react. I've got to handle the things that aren't on the map, right, that you can't see. Um, making them wait for that, because there wasn't any easy, quick way to do it that I could figure out. Um, that was... that that I, my, my recollection of that battle was I was bored in that battle because there was so much crap that I was doing. Now, I don't know if the players were, but the feeling I got from the Shrine of the Kuatoa and the feeling I got from that graveyard battle was boredom. Now, on the other hand, when my players were doing a uh, dramatic task, three misses in a row, that's ridiculous. My players are doing a dramatic task at fourth level. 
against the first legendary enemy they had ever fought who was doing legendary actions, and they'd, they'd not seen this before. I mean, a couple of them had seen it in other games, but the new player hadn't seen it at all. Um, and they were trying to use the dramatic task to shut a portal that was going to bring a, um, a shadow dragon through from the shadow fell while they were with bonus actions. They were using their bonus actions to do that while they were using their regular actions and their reactions to fight the bad guy, and he was like summoning allies and um, when skeletons went down and died he like used his reaction to have them get back up it was like you aren't you are not you haven't I'm not finished with you and they got back up that's a Matt Colville idea for goblins and I just like reskinned it for this necromancer that battle was epic it was exciting it was fun and the, what I remember from that battle is like exciting action right that's the feeling I got from that battle and so the reason I'm saying that you want to focus on feelings and not and, and like the emotional content of the scene and so on and not focus on anything sort of mechanical to begin with is that what your players are going to take away from each session is how they felt during the session. And I don't just mean having fun because you can have fun in a lot of ways, but whether they were creeped out or terrified or thought it was hilariously funny or angry or happy or sad and because something tragic happened that emotional content the the mood is what they're going to take away and the mood is the most powerful thing you can do with a setting right in deadlands you have the weird west and it is a horror weird science mood so that kind that tone right of the strange and deadly and terrifying and sort of out of mortal control stuff happening and how mortals are trying to bring into play technology weird science to kind of combat this this strangeness and the weird science has its own cost right that sort of um i don't know landscape of emotion and mood and feeling and flavor is what Deadlands is designed to accomplish as a setting, right? And so then this person who was talking about this said, you, you pick this first, you figure out your, your tone first. Now, again, it's already baked into things like East Texas University. And one of the things I like about Savage Worlds is they don't go the route of Pathfinder and Dungeons and Dragons where Galarian, which is the Pathfinder world and the Forgotten Realms, which is the main D&D world are everything and therefore flavorless there is no tone because every tone is there now you can take a chunk of the forgotten realms you can homebrew it a little bit and give it the tone you want but it's it's essentially toneless whereas if you play and notice one of the most popular ones is curse of strahd that is a horror type of setting that is very specific in tone and you can't do and have it fit well the other types of flavor that you'd get in other parts of Galarian or the Forgotten Realms in Barovia in Curse of Strahd. And so this flavor that you're trying to bring, this mood, the emotion, the feeling you want people to have at the table, generically, individual scenes will have different moods and individual sessions may have different moods from the whole setting, right? There might be a comedy moment in curse of strahd it's not always going to be dread right but if the but the setting should have some kind of a a, a tone you're trying to convey unless you want to do gonzo and just do a different tone her setting or you know different theme every week and so what i think savage worlds is really good at is having these very specific and um narrowly focused flavors to each setting um it sometimes frustrates GMs who want a generic flavorless setting because Savage Worlds kind of doesn't produce them. Other than Galarian, which is Pathfinder for Savage Worlds, they really kind of don't do that. Most of their settings, one person once said in a, in a forum post that in Savage Worlds, most settings are something with a, like X with a twist. So Deadlands isn't the Wild West. It's the Wild West with a twist of horror and weird science. And the last parsec isn't simply science fiction. It's science fiction with a twist. And East Texas University isn't isn't just regular, like, undergrad co-ed horror. It's horror with a twist. And so they've always got a twist to it. 
And the one person complaint was complaining, and he said, I just wish they would put, put out some settings without a twist. Savage Worlds kind of doesn't do that. And I think the reason is that Pinnacle is actively trying to create settings like Holler or Deadlands or um, East Texas University that have a very defined, clear flavor, a mood that you're supposed to be in as an overarching proposition in every session. You're coming to the table to be horrified or you're coming to the table to feel dread or you're coming to the table to laugh whatever it happens to be and that setting mood pervades and extends throughout the entire thing and so what this uh, person was saying in the uh, in the video can't remember his name was that in order to uh, to do that you have to read through the book the setting book and read through the lore and read through the base rules and then what you really need to do is make sure that all of the mechanics and all of the other things that go into the setting setting rules and this is not like from deadlands but like in in the savage worlds adventure edition they have like a dozen or more setting rules like born a hero or tough choices or whatever and you can look these up that are that affect like how you spend bennies or whether you even get them or how conviction works um and those setting rules are designed to convey different things. They make the game easier or deadlier or uh, scarier or funnier or, or more gonzo or whatever it is that you're trying to convey with your, with your setting. And so um, they bake some of these in, like Path Savage Pathfinder uses Conviction. It's a setting rule. They also use a wound cap, which is a setting rule, right? Doing those things has an effect on gameplay that's mechanical designed to serve the setting that they're trying to convey in Golarian and Pathfinder, right? And so what this uh, person was saying is you have to go in and ruthlessly prune, ban, change, edit, whatever, anything that doesn't serve the tone. Go in and cross out any edge that doesn't fit your tone, any skill that doesn't fit your tone. So for example, you're playing in an arcane world. Yes, hacking doesn't fit. It banned. You don't, you can't take hacking. Right, because it, it's not in theme for the setting. And he simply said, you know, do that to reinforce the setting. But one of the things that I thought about when he was saying this, and why you have to do it, and you, you definitely should, is that feelings, the, the mood, the feeling, the, the sensations you get from play, these are fragile. Right? It is so easy, and anybody, everybody who's played any role-playing games for any length of time knows this. It is incredibly hard to maintain that mood without it being broken by accident. Um, a very typical example happened in the very final session of my campaign, and I actually kind of ground my teeth a little bit. I know nobody was trying to ruin anything, right? And it was kind of in character, but I had written out a series of possible speeches depending on what, what they were doing that the big bad evil guy could say and then the one I was expecting was the one that I had worked the most on and that's the one that I felt was appropriate when they finally showed up and came face to face with the evil revenant guy and it was like a paragraph and a half speech of you know so you finally we meet you have been doing this and blah 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 and, you know threatening to kill them and something about what he said triggered the kind of more innocent the player who's playing this sort of innocent Aarakocra to kind of ask this kind of goofy corny question and everybody burst out laughing right and you know it's not that I'm was upset that there was a funny moment but here I had this really cool dramatic moment that was supposed to be like threatening them and I expected them to respond in an equally dramatic way and it, it ended up being a sitcom line right and that kind of broke the mood a little bit and you know, it wasn't the end of the world. We went on, we played the scene, it was fine. But my point is that kind of a thing, just one line, one comment from a player can shatter mood, can shatter the feeling that you're trying to go for, especially if you're going for something like dread or horror. These are extremely fragile types of uh, feelings to, that, that you can give to players because it's a game and it's, you're, you know, it's just miniatures on a game board or something. And if that's true, then how do you actually make the players feel fear or dread or horror or creep being creeped out? It, it can be done. You can see Jordan Callerman do it over and over again in his 
both his Deadlands and his ETU game on the Wild Cards channel and Saving Throw. Go watch it. They're great. Um, but watch out because they are going to spoil have spoilers for both settings. But um, so it's possible to achieve, but it's very fragile. And it's very easy for it to be broken, which is why you have to be very careful about maintaining it. Right? And making sure that all the rules of your game support it and any rule that doesn't support it gets banned and excised. Because it's so fragile that if you leave that stuff in, it can break the feel. So um, this partly comes up because I was on the Savage Worlds unofficial Discord and we were talking about... Dead it was in the, the Deadlands um, channel. So it's specific setting, Weird West. And we were talking about... I was talking about how hard it is going to be to sell my D&D players on a setting like Deadlands because, you know, they like playing all these weirdo races and Deadlands only has humans. And so the one GM who seems to be very sort of rule of cool said, um, well, why does it have to be only humans? If one of my players wanted to play a kobold in Deadlands, I would just let him. And I said, well, I wouldn't. And they were like, you know, as a GM, you're supposed to let your players do what they want and get, have fun. And if it's fun for your players to be... I said, well, it wouldn't be fun for me as a GM to run it. And my answer to them is, if you want to play a kobold in Deadlands, somebody else can GM. Or if you want to play a kobold in an appropriate setting like Pathfinder, I can maybe GM that. But I'm not GMing kobolds in Deadlands. And I didn't really articulate why. And, you know, we, we, I didn't want to get into a big argument. But this is why, right? Because having a goofy creature like a kobold show up in Deadlands where it doesn't belong is going to break the mood, the tone, the setting, the, the feel that you're going for. It won't feel like Weird West horror because you're adding this non-horror element to it that's going to break the illusion, right? And the illusion that generates the emotion that you're going to remember feeling weeks from now, that is the most fragile thing of all. It's a very fragile thing. And that's why you have to be very careful about allowing people to break it. Because if they if they do something that breaks that illusion, then all the feelings are gone and you end up with boredom. You end up with something that's not interesting. You're not going to, your players aren't going to feel the emotion that you wanted them to feel. The fear or the dread or the comedy, whatever it happens to be. If you're going to allow stuff into the game that breaks those feelings and those moods and so um and so as we were talking about this you know his sort of implication was oh well you know sort of player agency to be whatever character you want to be and gm shouldn't prevent that that's like you're being a mean gm to tell players they can't play the type of character they want but that's not the point right you're not being a mean gm right? i mean you, you might be a mean gm and just trying to stop players from doing what they want but most gms aren't the reason we create setting rules and make those rules and enforce those rules and make those rules strict isn't to harm or limit players just as a general proposition I want to limit you right it's to establish the emotional and um, sort of tonal quality of the setting so that while you're playing game sessions in this setting you experience the emotional landscape that it's designed to evoke, right? And again, it's a very fragile thing. It's very um, easy to break and destroy. And that's why as a GM, you have to be very careful with your setting rules and with the game mechanics. And that's why this um, person who was giving advice on setting up Suede said, you've got to prune, you've got to remove, you've got to excise anything that doesn't serve the mood the flavor as he said that you're trying to evoke with the setting and by the way he didn't just say getting rid of player character stuff he said you got to go through and read every npc and make sure that you know because the authors of the setting may not have the same flavor in mind exactly that you did you might want to take deadlands which is a combined sort of weird science um horror setting and you want might want to really focus on the horror and minimize the weird science and the authors aren't going to know that you wanted to do that so they might have a whole bunch of plot points in their plot point campaign or in their savage tales that are all about weird science and not about horror um and you might want to get rid of that stuff so in one of the 
one of the towns, I can't remember which one, there's a, a, a saloon, right, in Deadlands with a, like, a clockwork type animated steampunk bartender that, like, talks as, like, a robot, right? Well, I probably wouldn't want that thing in my game because that's a little too cornball. And I feel like interacting with that thing, if I'm trying to create a horror game, would reduce the feel of the horror and make it seem a little more comical. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have it, but what that means is that the authors of that part of the story don't know what tone I'm trying to set. They don't know what mood I'm trying to evoke for my players, and therefore they put stuff into the module that does not fit that emotional landscape that I'm trying to generate. And so what he said is you've got to go through the lore. And just as ruthlessly as you go through the edges and take options away from players, take stuff out of the lore that doesn't work. Rewrite it. Fix it. Eliminate it. Put your own stuff in there. Replace the things that are out of tone, that are out of flavor, with things that are in tone and match the flavor you're trying to go for. And make it yours. Don't just run it as is, because if you try to run it as is, it won't fit the emotional mood that you're trying to set in in your overall sort of the overall feel you want to have collectively for your game right and so i think this is actually really important and it's a key point it's not just the players that have to have their options some of their options removed if you want to establish a really strong uh sort of centralized flavor to the game and make it stick and make it feel that way each session You've got to go in and take away some GM options, too. Some of these NPCs aren't going to fit. Some of these locations aren't going to fit. And you're going to have to make up new locations. So he was talking about how he was running Deadlands Lost Colony. And he said, there's a whole bunch of adventures in the... They give you a campaign with the book, a plot point campaign. And he said, there are a whole bunch of adventures that assume the players are going to have access to a spaceship and are going to be flying around the solar system that they're in from Deadlands Lost Colony. Uh, the premise of Deadlands Lost Colony is that some of the cowboy-type weird science horror people from Deadlands went through a portal to another planet, and then Earth itself got destroyed, and so they're kind of stranded on this uh, sort of a weird west alt world, and then they have to kind of go out from there, and they go on potentially space, ad space adventures, but he wanted to keep them grounded. He wanted them to be in a weird west, like um, a weird west analog world that didn't have other worlds you could go to, right? He wanted them essentially trapped on this essentially alternate earth and unable to get out of it. And, and to have the tension of we can't get off this world and we have to stop what's happening on it. And that would have been destroyed if they just had a spaceship and could go anywhere, right? It wouldn't be... Bad things happening on this world wouldn't be as scary because we could just evacuate, right? So he, he said he had to take all of the adventures that they had on other worlds because they assumed the players would have a spaceship. He had to take the spaceship out of there. And then he had to relocate all of those adventures to the base starting world, right? And so... The point is, as a GM, he was taking away some of his own, you want to call it agency, options, right? He was taking that away because doing the, uh, the stuff as written would have broken the mood he was going for. And then his players in the sessions wouldn't have had the feelings that he was trying to evoke, right? That sense of being trapped on this world and you know, almost like being like trapped on a desert island. And this sort of survival horror, which is what he was going for, would have been way less pronounced if the players had known they could just get in a ship and, and leave the planet they were trying to sort of horror survive, right? And so, um, let's make sure this is all cleared here. I don't know where he's going to want to go. He wants to go out, right? So this should be nice and clear. Should be all right. We're not going to be able to protect him. Um... So if you're, if you're going for that sort of survival horror and there are mechanics in the game that destroy that, then you want to change those mechanics. So a great example is D&D 5th edition, right? Matt Colville talks about how 1st edition was more survival horror and 5th edition is more superheroes. 
let's say you decide and you, your group decides you want to do the survival horror with fifth edition well you're gonna probably have to make some changes some house rules let's go buddy so for example um professor dungeon master was showing it's hilarious his house rule on death saves which is that you don't get them when you go to zero hit points you die and like he crossed out the part of the thing where it says you make death saves across the whole paragraph just said you die and then he um, crossed out the paragraph about how death saves work where it says you roll for blah 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 it's a whole paragraph about rolling death saves and he crossed it all out and said you roll and he's up a new character right so his idea was that we're going to do it that way and they're going to do it that way because they want the survival horror back in their fifth edition game the way um you would have in uh is this guy gonna die no he's all right in the way you would have had in first edition now, i don't know why they don't just play first edition but they've chosen to play 5e but they've changed the rules to reinforce the feel that they are going for Let's see if i can assassinate him yeah there we go I could hit once in a while it would be nice he's still okay so it's important to remember if you're a player right again unless you have a bad GM we're not talking about bad GMs the GM who's a good GM trying to give you a good time you say well my GM says he's trying to make me have fun but he keeps telling me I can't play the races I want to play or the classes I want to play he's restricting things he's banning skills like when I banned wish well it's not necessarily the GM's trying to harm you right he, he's certainly not what the GM's trying to do probably is to reinforce the, the, what he's trying to accomplish or she's trying to accomplish for the setting I hate NPCs that help you so much because they don't help you they hurt you they're horrible and I wish every one of these missions would be deleted from the database I really do I don't mind leading them out but fighting with him is such a pain um, so what I would say is Rather than um, getting upset if the GM is making restrictions in the game, character options and so forth to enforce tone, be glad of it. Because it means that the GM has a particular goal for how they want to run the game and they're trying to evoke a mood and they have a very clear sense of the mood they're going to evoke and that means that that mood will be red present and you will have this emotional memory of your game session where you'll be able to look back on it and you might not be able to say everything that happens but instead of looking back on it and saying it was nothing or it was bored i was bored you can look back on it and said what i remember is that whole night i felt a sense of creeping dread or that whole night i couldn't stop laughing or that whole night i was i i felt like my pulse was racing and it was full of action and excitement right that is what you remember about a role-playing game and when we talk about our best sessions what we remember is that feeling, right? So I have often said my favorite D&D game I ever played was, was just me and my best friend. We played Castle Amber. It's the best basic expert game, expert camp, expert adventure we ever played. I can, I can tell you a few things that happened in it, but not mostly not. What I can tell you is how I felt. It was, it was um, really interesting. And so I was constantly like, in this discovery mode of finding out the interior of Castle Amber and what was going on. It was a mystery. And we were kind of plumbing the depths of this castle together. And I was finding out the mystery. And so there was this sense of curiosity and having that curiosity slowly satisfied. That's what I remember about Castle Amber, right? That sense of mysterious, something weird and mysterious is going on and we're trying to solve it. And that sense of uh, that you're never quite sure what's happening and uh, something odd is always going to be around the corner and so you're always kind of primed for that and you're a little tense and that tension kind of went throughout the entire summer that we played that that module and that's sort of the emotional mood that i remember um it, it was i mean, now when looking back at it it was survival horror and so that sort of sense of creeping dread that's there that there's something just around the corner that might come to get you you never know what to expect and you're trying to like survive and get out it's like being in a, in a like trapped in a room one of these like escape room things because you're trapped in castle amber and you can't get out um that feeling is what i remember right and so if you're a gm make sure that you understand what you're trying to go for with that and i would say talk to your players too because one of the things you want to make sure is that the feeling you're trying to evoke is one they want to feel not everyone wants to feel dread 
Not everyone wants to feel horror. Not everyone wants to think it's funny and laugh all evening. They might want to be serious. I want to be serious about it. If laughing is great. It's not that I don't like to laugh, but I'm not in for a comedy campaign. I'm in for a serious campaign. And I like that sense of like suspense and dread and that anything bad could happen right around the corner any minute. That's cool. And that's the feeling I want to get. Right. And so talk to your players about it. Make sure that the feeling you're trying to, if you're the GM, make sure the feeling you're trying to evoke is one that they will find pleasurable. And then make sure that you explain to them anything I'm banning, anything I'm changing is done in service of evoking this mood that we've all agreed, this tone that we all want to have for the game. And players, you should understand that when the GM bans a power or an edge or a spell or whatever, it's almost certainly not because they're trying to punish you Right? Yeah, sometimes, oh, that, that thing is overpowered. Well, even that is, a, is an emotional and mood-based argument, that if you have access to this power, the challenges will become trivialized. You will not feel them to be as much of a threat, and the mood of tension hanging over the table will lessen because you know you can do this thing that gives you an I win button to get out. Right? And um, that will then change how the sessions feel. And my, the newest player said this, that she, she didn't really like it as much after they got past, say, 6th level because she got this sense that once they got to 6th or 7th level, they, even though she stayed very cautious, she, she got the sense that they were essentially invulnerable, that they were unkillable, and that removed some of the tension for her. And she was enjoying the tension, the sense that my character might die, was giving her pleasure in the session and when they got to a point where their abilities were such that their character pretty much couldn't die that's when she sort of said I'm not sure that I like it as much right now there's no right or wrong answer to this there's no right way to feel in a game session and everybody likes something different and some people love the gonzo I want, some, I want to feel a different way every week which is perfectly fine but it's something you should talk about with your group. We keep coming up with this. Talk about with your players. What type of a tone, what type of a mood, what type of a feeling are we going for? Not in every minute, in every scene, in every session, but as an overall proposition for the campaign. What is our, what is our emotional landscape expected to be if we're exploring Strahd and Barovia compared to the emotional landscape you expect in Descent into Avernus, compared to the emotional landscape you expect in um, Tomb of Annihilation, compared to the emotional landscape you expect in Waterdeep Dragon Heist. They're all different. And you can achieve almost any tone with these games, especially something like Savage Worlds, which is a generic game. The question is, what type of a mood do we want as a general overarching theme for our group? Does everybody agree to it? And if everybody agrees, what do we need to do as a setting rule, set, and so forth to help evoke that? And we need to all understand that any mechanical changes we make to the game are done in service to evoking that mood that we've all said that we want. So I think that's enough for today. That's kind of my rant on um, how to match the setting to the to the mood so that you evoke, you're sort of using the setting rules and the mechanics in service of the flavor that you're trying to bring to the table every week, every session, and talk with your players about that. Maybe people want something different every session, and then you run a gonzo world. Um, I personally would not be happy doing that, but lots of people are. Right? So talk to your players, talk to each other, and use that information to help you decide what mood you want to have, what flavor you want to have for your game, what feeling you want to have felt at the end of a typical session, and then do everything else, setting rules, game mechanics, plot points, with which campaigns you run, NPCs in service of that setting and the feeling you're trying to evoke. And I think you can have a really memorable series of campaign sessions because then as you walk away from the table each week, you're going to have felt that mood, that, that feeling, those emotions that you wanted to evoke. Until next time, I am Scrapperlock. Let's rant with Scrapper. And, and uh, this has been... City of Heroes on the Rebirth server.